Because really, there isn't anything I can't do. Because if anyone can, Manny can. Thank you everybody. Welcome back to a brand new Manny Cam podcast. I am so excited for today's episode. And our first guest, I'm excited for him and for me. Because if many of you know, I want to become a journalist in the sports field. So without further ado, our first guest in today's Manny Cam first guest debut is uh been in the sports deck sports field in Southern California for the past three decades, is author for the Game of My Life, San Diego Chargers, the Game of My Life Rams, and just thanking me for my pronunciation. I'm still working on it. <laughs> I'm still working on it. Um, Shohei, Shohei Otani, the base, baseball rookie, and is currently contributor for Forbes magazine in the sports field, covering both LA teams. The Rams and Chargers, please welcome my great friend, Jay Paris. Manny, that sounds great. So good to be with you. Um, I've been looking forward to hooking up with you and talking some sports. And uh, let's go, Manny can. Here here we go, baby. Onward and here upward. We, you know, for those of you that know, I've met, I said it in my first episode. Well, it's not out yet by the time of this recording, but if you're hearing this, it's already out. I have already mentioned that. I learned, I met Jay through networking, and this is actually the first time we get to see face-to-face. -face. We talked over the phone, emails, text messages, <laughs> you know. Everything about smoke signals. We've been using every social platform there was to, to make a connection, and I'm glad we did. And that just shows if you want to meet somebody and if you want to uh, get a relationship going, you you, you reach out, and uh, and something, something always good comes out from it. All right. Now, Jay, I got to ask, how, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's uh, interesting going through this uh, pandemic, and uh, my heart just goes out to all the people that are uh, having a much tougher time than I am. Uh, you know, the sports world has certainly been affected, and, and games have been played, and games have been postponed, and that, that's been a whole uh, different ball of wax, you know, as on its own. So I, I, my heart just goes out to those people that uh, have certainly been affected by this much more than I have. I, I, I totally agree with you. You know, in the professional field, we got to look at it in the medical standpoint, the health, right. the health viewpoint, you know, I know us fans are eager to play and some of us weren't happy with, Oh, why are we getting our bye weeks or earlier? Why were we <laughs> this and that? You know, some of us, we just got to look, it's not just about our health, it's about the players' health and their family. We're, we're trying to entertain, but we got to follow some guidelines, healthy guidelines, stay healthy. That's how it works. And you got to remember, it's just not the players, it's those coaches and it's the assistant coaches and it's their family. And it's, uh, it's uh, a lot more than those 22 men out there running into each other, that's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's for sure. It's, it's a lot. I've been seeing a lot of behind videos, you know, on social media how a team prepares and honestly as much as I love the players right I gotta give huge prop to the people behind the scenes the reporters uh, the medical team the people that watch laundries keep inventory you know right coaches making sure everything is happening you know without them I don't know if we would have had sports right now yeah, it's a great point. Uh, the the medical team and uh, the protocol to, to stay safe. You just peel back that onion, and there's so many layers to to putting together a NFL game or NFL organization. And those cameras don't don't find the the people that do a lot of the work, a lot of the grunt work, and a lot of work that's not recognized. But that, that's that's the meaning of having a great organization. I mean, you can have a great left tackle, or you can have a great quarterback, or you can have a, a great player or two. But it's that organization, it's that culture. Culture. It's that looking out for each other. It's that accountability. It's uh, having the respect not only for yourself but for your teammate, and that's really who you're playing for is your teammate. But that's a that's a culture, and some organizations have it, and and, and some don't. So I, I think we're seeing some of that come out through this uh, pandemic, of which organizations uh, are taking it as serious as they can, and and the character of the players trying to uphold their end of the bargain. Correct. Now, um, so. My first question, you know, 
you've been doing this sports writing for three decades right. and it's different with the whole pandemic going on when you first started what are some of the differences you see in today's day to when you started well mostly just how we got the uh, story to the readers and how we got the uh, the content or the scores or the the feature stories to the the people so they could read them i mean we were uh, we certainly didn't have internet when i started out and uh, you would type up your story and uh, they'd take xeroxes of it in the newsroom and then they'd run that back to the printing press and then they'd run the printing press and and once your story was in that was it, baby. There was no updating and there was no adding something later. So when you put your story in, you, you know, you know, when I came to San Diego to cover the chargers, there were eight other papers. I mean, there were, there were eight different writers. I was going against every day. So maybe even if you learned something later, you couldn't really do anything to your story because it was already gone to the printing press. So that's the biggest, the biggest thing is how we've, we get the content, how we get the stories to the readers. Now, you know, with a tweet or an Instagram or everything's instantaneous, but yeah. it was a, it was a lot more laborious back then. And now it's more up to date. Like, you know, we say well, you can update a story now where when I first started, whenever you turned in your story, that's what was going to hit the front porch the next morning. And you, you mentioned eight writers, you know, I would assume it was a competition who would get their story first, correct? Absolutely. And I came in, I was a rookie in 1992 and I came in against TJ Simers of the LA times and Clark judge of the San Diego union before they merged and both of them hall of fame writers. I mean, these guys were good and I was petrified to read the paper every morning because I knew those guys might have something that I didn't. And that happened a lot, but it made me better. You know, it, it was competition. I tried to keep up with those guys and it was competitive but that being said, we had touch football games, we had barbecues, and when we go out on the road, we all go out to dinner on Saturday night. So it was that neat little competitive thing going on. But, you know, down deep, we all realized we were lucky or blessed to have, have this for an uh, occupation. So uh, we never lost sight of that, that's for sure. So I got to ask, back then, when you were trying to get your article printed, typed, printed, look, get, let it look by the editors, you know, publish it. It was a process, correct? It was a process and it was, uh, you never got uh, overconfident that you had it figured out because as you know, those ball games go to, you know, especially if you're covering baseball or, or high school football, you know, is where I started the high school football up in Orange County. I mean, that game got over at 10. You had to race back to the, to the paper and, and type it up and everything, but it made you good. It made, you know, you had a deadline is a deadline. You know, those editors, they don't care if the lights went off. They don't care if the homecoming halftime went longer and everything else. They're, they've got a deadline at 11 o'clock and you got to meet it with your story. So it, uh, it, it makes you work hard and it makes you uh, really read your stories really well, trying not to make a mistake. Because like I said, remember when that paper hits the doorstep the next day, your name's at the top of it. And if there's a mistake in there and somebody else didn't catch it, you feel terrible because you know everybody else is going, what's wrong with this Paris guy? He misspelled a guy's name. Yeah, I read, I saw a news headline. It was Patriots Falcons were a reporter. We know we all saw the Falcons, 28-3. We all know about all right. the blow up. <laughs> uh, she had the Falcons like technically ridden in the section and then when things started switching around, she had to change everything. So I, yeah. so do reporters have their stuff by the way the odds of the game is looking? Do yeah, you get it's called getting a jump on it. And uh, if it's a blowout or one team's up by a considerable margin, margin in the business, that's called an easy right. You got yeah. an easy right tonight because the game was decided early and stayed that way. So you're able to write your story. But this particularly happens in baseball a lot with the Padres when they used to play all those one run games, you know, you'd have your story saying one thing for eight innings and then it would change in the ninth inning yeah. and you have to be nimble enough to change stuff around. That, that's why sports writers get gray hair. So be careful. If you become a sports writer, you're going to lose that nice black hair you've got. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah Got to get used to it. Take all those selfies <laughs> I can right now. And, uh, a thing that you mentioned in our, our my first episode, 
you mentioned your mentor, John Wooden, the great UCLA men's basketball coach. And I was reading more about him because at the time I wasn't watching college basketball. You know, I was I was right. growing up and trying to find myself. I think I was eight when he retired, something like that. I bet. And, um, you know, I was looking at him how, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, I was doing last minute search. Was it seven straight with the divisional championships? Uh, NCAA titles. NCAA titles. Yeah. What I want to know, I mean, you said in the pod, in the previous podcast that if I want something, I'm the one that goes for it. How, why, how would you compare? Why would you compare me with him? That's my biggest question I have. Uh, just think of a positive outlook and, and knowing uh, there, there's no shortcuts. You know, Coach Wooden practices for the Bruins were a lot harder than the games, you know. So he, everybody worked. There weren't short, shortcuts. And if you really want it, you, you go get it. And and the, the six inches uh, between your, your ears, your mind, if, if you want to go for it, you go for it. And then your your heart's the other thing you can't measure. So if you got the if you got the want to and you got the heart, uh, that's a tough thing to, to turn away. That said, it's rarely a straight line from what somebody wants to do and where they want to end up. You go left and right and zig and zag and you, and people say no, and you got to keep going. And when somebody says no, just turn those letters around saying on, you know, keep on, just keep on going on. So, but, but I think the main thing is that uh, you recognize that you, that, that it takes hard work. It takes enthusiasm. And it thinks, and it takes a grateful attitude for all these people that are giving you a chance. Yes, correct. I agree with you. We all go through obstacles, like you said, champions and winners are built different. You know, it depends how hard you want it in life. And then, so you mentioned he was a mentor to you. I bet you obviously you met him, correct? I was lucky to toward the end of yeah, I sure did toward so the end of his. Life. Did you write a paper for him, or how how's that go? Walk me through the process, you know. Uh, I, I think it was at a, a San Diego Hall of Champions luncheon. Uh, Coach Wooden was being honored, and uh, I was lucky enough to to talk to him, spend a little bit of time with him uh, before the before the ceremony, and then uh, we would, went from that and wrote a story about the about him being honored. And uh, yeah, it was a, it was goosebump. You know, you don't get to see see your heroes a lot, and uh, yeah, a lot of times a lot of times when you do, they're not what you think they are. And, it's and this guy was. Yeah, you're. You shake and you're nervous. Like the first <laughs> right. phone call when I called you, I'm like, oh my God, this is actually happening. I'm one step closer <laughs> to my getting answers about the journalistic career. That's great. Yeah, you know, you're you're just as good as ever, anybody else, but no better than anybody else. You remember that? Yeah. That's a good one to go. Now, uh, Jay Paris, I, you have told me how you became a journalist, but I bet there's probably a journalist out there, someone that wants to become a journalist. What made you lead to become a journalist? Uh, just the love of sports, love of athletics, and the way uh, athletics brings people together. You know, that vibe, that that feeling you get when you're at a sporting event. And, and I wanted to be a part of that. And I like to play sports, but I, I found out when they started throwing curveballs in college, I probably wasn't going to make it as a baseball player. So I uh, always liked literature and always liked writing. So I figured, hey, if they're paying those people upstairs to to watch the game and write about it, uh, I'll, I'll give that a try. So you just started with the school papers and started covering Little League games and started covering junior college games and high school. And, and, and uh, you go from there. So it, it wasn't very glamorous at the beginning. And, and it's, uh, you know, you get tested, that's for sure. But if you want it, like we talked about, you just you just keep going and just make little progress every day. You know, you're probably not going to make a huge jump. But if you just if you win the day, you're heading in the right direction. Correct. You know, baby steps, I like to call it. There's, there's always going to be something out there, but you got to start small yep. before you make it big. You know, there's like a lot of great players that we could talk about. Peyton, um, not Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, you know, he was undrafted. Was it a draft or a seventh round? No, the Chargers had a chance at him. 
And yeah. uh, Mike Riley was the coach then, and he asked Bobby Beathard if he would take a chance on this guy named Brady because Mike Riley had been an assistant coach at USC, and he'd recruited Brady, and Beathard took a, another quarterback and didn't work out as well. Yeah. You know, we, we saw what he's done, and the stats he's putting up at his age now, it's it's unbelievable. Yeah, he is unbelievable. 43 now, and uh, doesn't have the big arm like he used to, but he, he can still get it done. That's he can still get it done. You know, I was excited when I saw Justin Herberts taking on Brady, and at the end of the day, my heart got broken, like, every week for the past season. Yeah, being a Charger fan, that you talk about uh, having to keep a, a stiff upper lip. You know that more than ever, don't you, man? Yeah. You, you love your Chargers, but sometimes they're tough to root for. It, it's tough to root for. I I see a lot of people mad, frustrated. I Trust me, I get mad, but at the end of the day, these are my Chargers. They're, they're what brings my joy. They're the reason why I love sports. You know, I grew up around a family where we watched we used to watch football growing up, you know, the barbecue. And one day I decided, you know what? We're eating food almost every Sunday. I got to get into this. And luckily I got hooked and the charges became one thing closer to my heart. Yeah. Once you get, once you get hooked, it's, it's hard to turn back. And yeah, just again, you know, sports brings people together, brought people together with you. Even when they were in San Diego and they left to Los Angeles, I had the opportunity to go to my first game. It was Thursday night. It was back at the time when they had the color rush uniforms. I saw mm -hmm. the Chargers taking on the Denver Broncos. Thankfully, they won that match, and I was able to experience it. And then when they announced their move in February after the season, I, was, I wanted to boycott the Chargers so bad. But at the end of the day, I'm like, I can't do this. I'm a target for life. Yeah, you just you got so much invested emotionally and just well, you remember good times, you know, remember being with the people and having your food and watching the ball game and they're tough to say it's tough to say bye to. Yeah, correct. You know what are what is one thing, like what is one story that you can share with us in the audience that you have experienced with a player or a coach? Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of them, that's for sure. LaDainey Tomlinson, I think he, he's always one of my favorite guys. Uh, how uh, uh, nice he was to the riders. He always took care, took care of the riders and that uh, he was a truthful guy. He, I, actually, he always I actually had the opportunity not to personally meet Lundanian Thomason, but he went to my elementary school. Wow. Uh, I want to say, I want to say it was before he left to the Jets. Um, he, he started this program here in San Diego. I don't know. I don't know if it went all over Southern California where they give lunch to students to take home once a week. And I was able to meet him, hear his personal story and, you know, it was an amazing time. You know, he is a great, humble guy. Sometimes I miss him yep. wearing the jersey, but. <laughs> That's what made him great was he was very humble and, it, and he was uh, good to the writers and he's good to the fans, like you said. And uh, it's guys like that you, you gravitate to. And, you know, you're really not supposed to root for anybody when you're covering the game. You cover it, you know, right down the middle. But it's hard not to root for a guy like LT when, when you see his production and it, you see the type of player he is, he is too. Is that who you grew up with, LT? Was he your favorite? I, I grew up with LT, Philip Rivers, you know, and it was hard for me this year to, to watch Philip Rivers wear another jersey because he's, right. he's the only person I saw under center while I was watching football, you know. If it was if he were retired, it would have it would have felt different. But I yeah, the game, I, I'm like this doesn't feel right. <laughs> he looks funny in that Colts uniform, doesn't he? he? Does, I'll tell you. But I, I'm actually proud and glad he went to a team 
that got him an offensive line that can protect him. And I, right. I believe they're, he's on the race for the top of the division right now. I'll tell you a good Philip Rivers story, Manny. I don't know if I've told you the one about he's he was supposed to speak in front of, uh, I think, a Catholic organization in Phoenix, Arizona on a Tuesday, which is always the off day on the NFL. Every Tuesday you're off. <clears throat> so this the meeting started. Uh, it was a Tuesday morning meeting, late morning, early afternoon. He goes over to the airport, San Diego airport, to fly over there, you know, 45 minutes over there. No big yeah. deal. He gets there. San Diego airport fogged in. You can't see the planes, let alone being taken off, you know. So <clears throat> no flights are going out. Most guys, so he can't go to Phoenix is with the bottom line. Most guys would make a call and send over an autograph football or something and say, you know, I can't make it. We're fogged out. Philip Rivers got in his car and drove five hours to Phoenix, gave a talk for 90 minutes, got back in his car and drove home five hours. Now, that's that's a Philip Rivers story. You know, he didn't have to do that, you know, but he said he told him he'd be there and he didn't want to let him down. And it's just an amazing story that a player at his magnitude and being a superstar like he is, you know, that just yeah. doesn't happen. But that's Philip Rivers. You have already told me the story, but I, I just love hearing it. You know, it's what he defines by him. And I know he has a retirement plan already to go yeah. coach a football team. <laughs> And, you know, I always see Philip Rivers coaching because he, for the people that don't know sports that are listening for the support, Philip Rivers is one of the funniest but cleanest trash right. out in the field. And I'm just looking forward for him. See how, if he's going to trash talk as a coach at a high school level, <laughs> you know, how is he going to do it? Yeah, he'll be funny to watch. He's so energetic and his voice gets so high and he gets all hyped up, you know. But as you know, he, he never cusses. He never uses a swear yes. word. I, he's, always, he's always yapping. I, I still remember when we were playing Jacksonville last year. It was a screen to Austin Eckler for 99 yards. And he just told the defensive oh, lineman, yeah. he's like, 99, you know, started teasing them. <laughs> and I just kept laughing, you know. I'm going to miss it come from a charity standpoint, but I look forward for his coaching career, you know. You know, my, my goal for this podcast is to network out there and possibly get some of my favorite players to come sure. on and talk about their stories, you know. But like I said, it starts baby steps one step at a time. Right on. Yeah, you look how much farther you are along than you were, you know, six months ago. So you're heading yeah. in the right direction. That's the if main I thing. If I were to compare myself a year ago, I was not the same. I was, I would not be willing to send out emails or, you know, I was holding you to this whole email game. I started <laughs> emailing you. I emailed Jeff Dobson from the Babe and Jeff right. show. I, I got connected with Dave Pallet. I got to give him a little interview for my journalism class. I learned a lot. And then wow. he made Keep in contact with Katie Temple from San Diego. You're lucky, man. You got you're blessed. You got a lot of people in your corner. Nobody can ask yeah, more than that. Starts with one person, you know. It's just getting pushed out of your comfort zone, you know. Yeah, that's right. If it was easy, everybody would do it, right? So everybody got, would do it. That's, that's if one you don't thing have I, it, that's it's one thing not I, having a, no fear of failure, you know. If you fail, you fail. If, but you can't fear it, you know. And once you get past that, you can do anything. Yeah, someone once told me that failure is key to success. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. I agree with that one. That's for sure. <laughs> and I, I totally agree because uh, I failed so many times, you know, in my life. But it's up to me if I want to bounce back up, you know. That's right. I'm I, I'm betting on you. How's that? Hey, I I like to take any <laughs> challenge. That's my middle name, the challenger. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm out of questions. If you have okay, anything man. you want to ask, I just wanted to to uh, to, uh, to remind you and everybody else that uh, you know, dream big and go for it. I mean, you know, the time passes, and that time's going to pass anyway. So you might be might as well be chasing after something. 
and uh, you know, go for it and shoot for the moon. If you fail that, you usually land on a star at least, you know, but at least go for it. And uh, I, I think uh, you're, you're, you're heading the right way. We're getting, getting in touch with people and, and getting your emails out and, and making your networking. And I'm, uh, I'm just honored to be one of the first guys on this show. And I can't wait to see who, who you're going to have on this show. I got a feeling you're going to have some pretty good guests. I, it's in the works. It's in the works, Jay. I have some potential people, you know. I hear you. I it's hear in the you. Works. I don't want to <laughs> say you don't want to say too much, you know. But it's I in got the works. you. You want to jinx? Well, thanks again for having me on, Manny. I love you, pal, and uh, I'm rooting for you, and I'm in your corner 100. percent And before we go, do you have anything? What are the the people at home listening or watching at, in our YouTube channel where we're going to release this? Where they can follow you, what they're looking forward for you. Sure. Uh, Any project got, going I'm on? Doing some NFL for Forbes.com. Uh, that's at Forbes.com, uh, the Chargers and Rams. You can follow me on Twitter at JParis underscore sports. And I do a weekly column for the Coast News up in North County, San Diego as well, which is uh, keeps me connected with the community. So uh, that's what I got going. And uh, more importantly, I can't wait to see what you got going. All right. Well, thank you, Jay Perry. Right. Uh, it's going to sound a little odd right now, but I am encouraging my my guests and people listening to say it with me, if Manny can, and then you say your name, can. I want to get everyone used to saying the word I can't because I don't believe in the word I can't. <laughs> if you want to so say it with me, if Manny can. If Jay Manny Perry. can. If Manny can, Jay Paris can. And whenever I get down in the dumps or anything, I'm just going to think, what would Manny do? And Manny would say, get your rear in the gear. Let's go. If Manny can, Jay Paris can. Let's go. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the podcast. This was Manny Can and Jay Paris. Thank you very much, my pal. <laughs>